We're now going to shift our focus from the xylophone in Europe and America to the marimba in Central America, specifically in Guatemala, which is where the marimba traveled from West Africa into Central America. It is what is now known as Guatemala. This is a Guatemalan gourd marimba because the resonators of the instrument are made from gourds. You may remember the African balafone marimba had gourd resonators. This is also a diatonic marimba, meaning it has one row of keys and one scale only, which is another feature that the gourd marimba in Central America shares with the African marimba, which is its predecessor. This is another example of a Guatemalan gourd marimba from about the turn of the 20th century. You can see the long elongated gourds under each bar. It's one row of rosewood bars. So this is a diatonic gourd marimba in Guatemala, very similar to the African instruments on which it's modeled. The next development in the Guatemala marimba were its resonators. So the gourd resonators were done away with and replaced by resonators made of cedar wood. This is an example of a diatonic Guatemala marimba with cedar wood resonators. It's a little hard to ascertain the details in this photograph due to the lighting. The shape of the resonators are elongated boxes. They're narrower at the top where they meet the marimba bar and they broaden out in diameter at the bottom and this increases the register in terms of bass capability. Another feature of the cedar wood resonators in Guatemala at this time are a buzzing membrane placed on the bottom tip of each resonator. They're very difficult to see in this photograph, but on close examination we can see that there is a membrane on the lower tip of each resonator here. That membrane is made from probably the intestines of an animal, and it's held onto the resonator with beeswax. The purpose of that membrane is that it makes a buzzing sound every time the instrument is sounded. This is a feature that is virtually identical to the balafone of Africa. And what's interesting about this feature is that it's a very specific design feature. It's almost a sophisticated feature. The chances that two cultures would come up with such a sophisticated design feature, one after the other, make it more probable that this was a design feature that was brought over in the knowledge of the African slaves from West Africa. Diatonic marimbas at that time in Guatemala, and I'm speaking about the late 1800s, early 1900s, were used basically for folk music. But Guatemalans started to play other types of music as well. They formed ensembles of marimbists, usually four to six people, and they started incorporating classical music from America, other popular music from America like songs and so forth. One of the issues they had, it became kind of a musical problem to them on a diatonic keyboard, was that the keyboard only has one scale or one key. So the Guatemalans were very inventive about that. They actually had like an ingenuity about it. They were already using beeswax in the construction of the marimbas that we talked about with a little membrane on the bottom of, of each resonator. So they had access to beeswax. What they did was they took balls of beeswax of various sizes and they strung them from the frame of the diatonic marimba. So you had a ball of wax hanging by a string or a rope and there was a few of those balls of wax that were larger in the bass register and smaller as they got up towards the treble register. Now, I think we know as percussionists that the larger and heavier a marimba bar is, the lower its pitch is going to be. So let's say that the Guatemala marimba had a B natural, and they wanted to make that B natural be a B flat. They would take a ball of beeswax, they would take it and stick it onto the B natural because the beeswax was somewhat adhesive, the beeswax would increase the weight of the B natural, and now that note would sound like a B flat. So if they were in the key of C, for instance, and they wanted to modulate to the key of F, they needed to take a B natural, and for the key of F major, they need a B flat, no problem. They would take a little beeswax, stick it to the bar very quickly while they were playing, and suddenly they could now play in the key of F major. This beeswax technology for modulating keys on the Guatemalan marimbas only would go so far, unfortunately. If there was more than one flat that was needed quickly, it would be difficult to do also, depending on the range of the instrument. You'd have to have an, enough beeswax to change certain keys for certain modulations. This came to a head in the year 1896 in Guatemala and actually was the impetus for the development of the world's first chromatic marimba. There was a family called the Hurtado family in Guatemala in the 1890s. This was a group of six brothers and cousins of the father, Sebastian Hurtado. They were a very accomplished 
group of marimbiros, as the Guatemalans call them. They were a very sophisticated group of marimba performers, but they were performing on diatonic instruments. Guatemalan performers on marimba were not only playing folk music, they were also playing classical music and other music from America. This particular group, the Hurtado family marimba ensemble, was learning the classical piece Poet and Peasant Overture by Von Supe. This is a piece with five and six flats in various sections, and it modulates from one section to the next into remote key areas. This was basically impossible for the Hurtado family to learn on diatonic marimbas. No matter whether they had beeswax to help them or not to change certain pitches, it was just too complex of a harmonic modulation type of musical style to ever be played on a diatonic marimba. Sebastian Hurtado, the father of this ensemble, was a, a church organist by trade. So he was familiar with the, key, the keyboard layout for an organ or a piano. And so he decided to tackle this problem once and for all in a better way. And what Sebastian Hurtado did in 1896 was develop the world's first chromatic marimba with a keyboard layout that we have today. The image you're looking at is Sebastian Hurtado actually in 1896 with that very first chromatic marimba ever developed. It's very easy to see in this particular resolution on the bottom of each of the cedarwood resonators you can see the small round circle and that's actually the beeswax holding the membrane on for the buzzing effect. The Guatemalans call that buzzing sound charlio and to a Guatemalan or Mexican marimba's ear a marimba would be naked without that buzzing sound that accompanies the vibration of the wooden bars. This is an image of the Hurtado Brothers Royal Marimba Band of Guatemala on tour in the United States. It's actually an advertising photograph for the Victor Phonograph Company because the Hurtado Marimba Band made phonograph recordings for several phonograph companies, including the Victor Phonograph Company in New York City. This photo dates to about 1915 when the Hurtado Brothers were in New York City doing touring and making phonograph records. And you can see here there are two marimbas with chromatic double key layouts. The two marimbas together would be called by Guatemalans the marimba doble, with the marimba grande being the larger of the two instruments and then the smaller treble instruments. So two instruments together that the Guatemalans almost thought of as one instrument, the marimba doble. So we were talking about the Poet and Peasant Overture, which is indirectly the impetus to the development of the chromatic marimba. And that was the Hurtado family marimba ensemble. Here we have a recording made in 1915 in New York City by the Hurtado Brothers Marimba Band playing the Poet and Peasant Overture on their marimba doble, two chromatic marimbas. Let's listen. <laughs> Thank you. 
from Guatemala to travel to the United States. Their tour was highly successful because primarily people had never seen anything like this in the United States. These huge marimbas with their buzzing sound were a novelty and also the Hurtado brothers were a highly polished musical ensemble so it was good quality music in several styles on an instrument that Americans had basically never even heard of. Following the success of the Hurtados, other marimba groups from Central America decided to tour America as well. This is the Blue and White Marimba Band, which is again, a sort of a family type ensemble, which was not uncommon at that time in Guatemala for Marimba ensembles to basically be family organizations. So this is the Blue and White Marimba Band. Again, this is the 19 teens, probably about 1916, 1917 or so. However, the Blue and White Marimba Band doesn't have their own family name for the name of the group. They call themselves, as I said, the Blue and White Marimba Band. So the name for that is probably due to the Guatemalan flag. And here is an image of the Guatemalan flag that might explain why they used the name blue and white, because look at the flag, blue and white Guatemalan flag. 